I have a twin sister, Marsha, and uh, she said if uh, she would shave her head, she'd look just, just like me. So, and I think that's a good thing. So she was trying to compare herself to me. I also have a younger brother, uh, Keith, and he has a twin sister, Carla, and we're 20 months apart. So my mother uh, lost most of her hair um, trying to raise us, but uh, Praise the Lord, we all uh, know the Lord, we're all serving the Lord in some way or another, and so God has been so good to our family. I actually met my wife Renee uh, through the Whites, with, through Child Evangelism Fellowship. My life has revolved around Child Evangelism Fellowship. Uh, she was a summer missionary, a CYA with CEF, and uh, we served together here in Mifflin, Juniata, and Perry Counties uh, for three summers, and then after that summer we uh, were married and we've continued to serve the Lord full time with CEF uh, in several different areas. First of all, here in Mifflin, Juniata and Perry counties. And then uh, we moved to Lancaster County where we were field workers and then to Williamsport where I was a local director for Lycoming County and then back to Lancaster County where I was local director and then in uh, the South Central chapter which is in the Altoona area where I currently reside. Uh, with my wife and uh, three boys who live next door to me. They're all grown, but my oldest son bought the house next door and they're all bachelors and they live next door and we get to see them quite often, which is, which is good. My wife loves it. I just have to tell, tell them every once in a while, do you have a home? But, but that's okay. We love them. And uh, I have a, uh, of course, a daughter who's married to uh, Stephen Teeny, that's the one that we were praying for this morning. And uh, Kayla is uh, having our third grandbaby. And so we're excited about that. Her husband is a local director for me in the Butler, Mercer, and Lawrence County area, just above Pittsburgh. And so uh, CEF is a family thing. And when they're home, uh, we do not talk shop. So uh, uh, it, it's confliction sometimes because I'm father-in-law and father and then also boss. So uh, that makes it a little bit challenging at times, but we, we love it and we love having uh, the family business, so to speak, Child Evangelism Fellowship, and being able to serve the Lord uh, in that way. So it's been 35 years, it's hard to believe 35 years since I started full time with the ministry of CEF and God has been so good over the years. We've seen God's faithfulness uh, in the ministry as he has provided for us and we have seen many boys and girls come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you a quick story because it happened here in Reedsville and that was when I was 17 years old. Uh, I was serving as a CYA'er and I remember being dropped off and I don't even remember the neighborhood here in Reedsville but I just remember that my partner, we had partners and we dropped each other off and we did a five-day club where we did open-air witnessing and this particular time we were doing some open-air witnessing and uh, I was nervous I always uh, was very nervous doing open-air because we would use the wordless book and we would go door to door and knock or if somebody was sitting on their front porch we would say hey do you want to hear a story and I remember going up the street and being very nervous I uh, was looking over to my left and I saw a man, it looked like an abandoned house, but there was a swing on the front porch. And the man hollered down, he says, are you looking for somebody? And I said, I I'm just out and I'm just uh, sharing the message of the wordless book. And he said, well, you know, there's a couple just down in the gully right across the street and he needs to hear the about the Lord. And I, I, I looked at him and I said, okay. And again, I'm 17 years old, so I go and I knock on the door and the wife answers the door and she said, can I help you? And I said, I'm here to share the wordless book. And again, I'm a teenager and she said, well, what's the wordless book? And I said, it's the gospel I wanna uh, share about the Lord. And tears came to her eyes and she said, my husband's waited to, waiting for somebody to tell him about the Lord. And I walked in and I sat down in the living room and I shared the gospel uh, with them. And he came to the Lord and she said, he has cancer, he only has six months to live. And uh, she said, how did you hear about us? And I said, well, there's a man across the street and he told me uh, that I should come. And uh, she, she said, well, there's no man across the street. 
Um, that house has been abandoned for three years. And uh, that, that shook me up. That shook me up because God's, God will work. God will do his thing. And he wanted me to share the gospel with that individual. And that changed my life forever. And that's why I'm in the ministry of CEF today. Um, God has burdened my heart for the ministry of CEF, and I just praise the Lord for that. And God's been so faithful over the last 35 years. So that's just a little bit about my history. And so I want to just start this morning, before I get into the message and before I share a little bit more about CEF, uh, I want to just commit this time to the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you once again for uh, this time that we can open up your word, that we can uh, hear your word. And I pray, Father, this morning that you would speak to our hearts, Father, that you would speak through me, give me the words to say, and Lord, that uh, again, your will might be done. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the things over the last 35 years that I've had the opportunity to do is speak in a lot of churches. And uh, one evening I was at a church uh, over in the Altoona uh, area and uh, I was with a, a group of uh, folks for a Sunday evening service and it was more informal, it was more of a Bible study. And we were sitting there and I asked the folks a question. I said, how many of you have ever had the opportunity to share the gospel or share your testimony with somebody and lead them to the Lord? And they all sat there and they looked at me. And I would say there were about 20 to 25 people that were sitting around the table. Not one of those individuals, and again, these were older folks that we're talking about, had ever had the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody else. And so I thought about that for a moment and I have been in some churches since then and I asked that very same question. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody else? And it's been revealing that very few have. And there are reasons for that. But as I thought about that, I heard the, an old saying that says that, you know, there's the great commission, but the church has committed the great omission in that we are not living out Jesus Christ in front of people that we come in contact with. Yeah, a lot of people will say, well, you know what? I do my best to, to be an example. But you know what? You need to share your faith. You need to share your testimony with others. God gave us, Jesus gave us a command to go and to fulfill the Great Commission and not the great omission. This morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to the, to the book of Matthew, a very familiar portion of Scripture, Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to read verses 16 to 20. Again, very familiar portion of Scripture. Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. And this is what God's Word says. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into the mountains where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you even to the end of the world. You know, as I read that portion of scriptures, I think of one of the greatest missionaries that, as far as I'm concerned, that ever lived, and that was Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had arrived in China at the age of 21, to practice medicine, to share the gospel with the people there. He adopted the customs, the dress, and his goal was to reach them with the good news of the gospel. I love what he wrote while he was there. He said, can all Christians in England, and again, that's where he was from, sit still with folded arms while these multitudes in China are perishing? perishing for the lack of knowledge. For the lack of knowledge which 
England possesses so richly. The Great Commission is not a suggestion to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Again, by the time Hudson Taylor died in 1901, there were 850 missionaries working through China Inland Mission, sharing the good news of the gospel with others. So I think about what Jesus said. He said to go and make disciples. He also said that all authority in heaven and in earth is given to me. What's amazing about the Great Commission is that Jesus originally spoke these words to 11 men who uh, he wanted to go out throughout the whole earth at that time to share the good news. Reminds me of two milk cows eating grass. When a milk truck drove by, a sign on the truck said, fresh milk, homogenized, pasteurized, fortified, low fat, vitamin enriched. After reading the descriptions, one cow said to the other, it kind of makes you feel inadequate, doesn't it? Can you imagine the disciples as this command was given by the Lord Jesus Christ to go and share the good news? To share this, he commanded them to do it. I can just imagine Simon Peter speaking up and saying, but Lord, we're just 11 men. We're uneducated fishermen. We have no money, no machinery, and no means. And maybe, maybe we can just hang out here and do our thing here. You know, how can we go to all nations? How can we stand before the military right, might of the Roman Empire? How can we argue with the sophistication and intellectualism of the Greeks? Lord, how can we do it? I can just imagine him saying that. And the Lord said like this, no, you can't do it. That's why I'm giving you both power and authority to do it. Again, Jesus claimed to have all authority in heaven. That means that when Jesus speaks in heaven, it is done. He also claimed to have all authority on earth. And you know what? He's given that authority to you and I to go and to share the good news of the gospel. Again, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them the power and authority to drive out demons, to cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim with his authority on the earth. And again, this is something that he's given to you and I. I mean, you've all heard the, the, the saying that police say in movies and in television where they say to a suspect, stop in the name of the law. Now again, he's telling that person to stop, not in his own name, but in the name of the law. And that's what Jesus is doing for us. He's saying, you know what, you're not doing it in your own name. You're not doing it in the name of Big Valley Bible Church, but you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we don't go share the gospel in our own name. And that brings me to, to point number two. Jesus gave us an assignment. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And I want to unpack that this morning just a little bit for a moment. When Jesus said go, he used it as a participle which means he really said, as you are going, make disciples of all nations. Again, so it isn't a, a, a command for us to get up and go someplace where we've never been before, like Africa or China. It means that what Jesus is saying here, as you are going or as you're living in normal traffic patterns of life, you are to go. Again, not to necessarily Canada or Peru or Mexico because he used the word ethnos which means to take the good news to every ethnic group on earth again when you live in a place like Mifflin County there's not a whole lot of ethnic diversity but you know what where you live and as you live the traffic patterns that you're living here in Mifflin County or Juniata County or whatever county you live in you are to go and you are to share that message of the gospel with others that means sharing it in your neighborhood building relationships with your co-workers with your schoolmates 
sharing the good news with others. You know, before he ascended into heaven, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So as we go, we share the good news with other people that we come in contact with. And you know what? The power of God's Holy Spirit will be with us to help us to go and to do what he's called us to do. He also says that we are to baptize. And of course, we believe in baptism. We believe in water baptism. And of course, as we baptize, as Jesus says, we go and, and baptize others. We are telling them that they are identifying with Jesus Christ. They were lost in sin, but as they're baptized and they're coming up out of the water, they're identifying and sharing with others that they have committed themselves to Jesus Christ, that they love the Lord and they received him as their savior from sin. So I hope this morning you're asking yourself at this point, what is my part? What does God want me to do with the Great Commission. And you know what, I'm glad you asked because I can see you all out there going, yep, yeah, I, I need to know that. And I hope, I hope you do. Again, there is something that everyone can do to be a part of God's divine assignment for all of us. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to pray. <laughs> That's the very first thing that we need to do. We need to pray for more missionaries. We need to pray for more workers for the harvest field. You know, it would be very difficult for me as state director for CEF to oversee Pennsylvania and try to do all the work all by myself because I wouldn't get very far. But God uses people, imperfect people, to go and to share the good news of the gospel. You know, again, I talked about Hudson Taylor. In 1853, when Hudson Taylor started out from England for China, there were less than a hundred missionaries taking the gospel to the people that had never heard. After he had passed away, there were a hundred thousand missionaries sharing the gospel with China Inland Mission. Again, because you know what he did? He prayed and he prayed the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers for the harvest field. Years ago, Lanny Wolf wrote a poem, a song entitled, My House is Full. The lyrics say, there is peace and contentment in my father's house today. Lots of food on the table and no one is turned away. There is singing and laughter as the hours pass by, but the hush calms the singing as the father sadly cries. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work my field. No one wants to work in my field. You know, that is one of the things that I pray as a state director, and we pray as a ministry that God would raise up workers, not only worldwide, because we are in over 200 countries around the world sharing the gospel with boys and girls, but here in the local area, sharing the gospel with children who desperately need to hear. And I know you have a Wednesday night ministry and you bring kids in on the van and you can see what is going on with some of these kids and the home lives that they're living and the opportunity to share God's love with them and that they can trust Jesus Christ as their savior. And so we need to love, and that brings me to the next point, we need to love the lost people around us. Again, God has placed people in our sphere of influence who don't know the Lord, children, adults. Again, they're lost without Christ. Again, they may be your coworkers, they may be your teammates or your school friends. Again, there are different ways that you can love them to Jesus. You can show them the love of Christ in the way you treat them. You can pray for their salvation. Pray that God, the hound of heaven, would reach them. And at the right time that God gives you, you can share the gospel with them. Now, some of you might be sitting here this morning and say, well, Mark, you've been doing this for 35 years. It's easy for you to do. But you know what? 
Every time I share the gospel, I pray and say, God, it's not my words, it's your words. Because he says to us, now therefore go, and I will be with the words of your mouth, and I will give you what you shall say. God will help you as you go. Again, I've had a lot of people talk to me and say, you know, I would like to talk to this person over here, but I, I get all fumbled up and I, don't, I just don't know what to say. Ask God. Ask God what you should say and he will give you the words. And some people have said to me, you know, I, I prayed before I went and God showed me. And the person will actually listen. Now, they might not have trusted Christ at that moment, but that's God's business. I'm not the one that saves them. God is the one that saves them. And that's a cool experience that you have because I remember we were in uh, downtown Lancaster City uh, with summer ministry and we did some open air work uh, in, in the uh, uh, Hispanic section of Lancaster City. And I remember one of the gals from my local area was so scared to get out of the van and she held on to the handle and said, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And my daughter had to say, I'll go with you. <laughs> <laughs> she was 10 years old. She said, I'll go with you. And she went out and she was going with fear, but she had the opportunity to share the gospel with one child and that child trusted Christ. And then she got all excited. She goes, I want to do it again. I want to do it again. And she was so excited. And you know, when we have the opportunity, we're sitting on a gold mine and we have the opportunity to share the gospel and save them from hell. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I love it. Again, some of us are reluctant to talk to people about Christ because we don't want to offend them. A while back, I watched an amazing video that someone sent me on Facebook. It was a video of Penn Gilliatt online. And someone sent me, yeah, again, he, he's a half uh, of the, the act in Las Vegas of Penn and Teller. But Penn isn't a Christian. He claims to be an atheist. And in the video, he talks about after one of his shows, a man gave him a Gideon Bible. Again, it was a New Testament. Again, Penn wasn't offended even though he was an atheist. In fact, he recorded a video in which he said, if you believe that there is a heaven and that there is a hell, then you should not be socially awkward to go and tell someone else about Jesus, about everlasting life. He says, how much can you hate someone if you have the answer and you refuse to tell them about Jesus Christ? How much do you hate somebody not to do that? And of course, that was very convicting for me as I heard that. Again, God puts people into our paths. I believe that God gives us divine appointments and that he gives us opportunities to share the gospel with others. Do we take advantage of those opportunities? Or do we let it go and say someone else can do it? So again, we need to love those people. We need to reach them for Jesus Christ. And then C, we need to invest financially in missions. Again, I checked, we just came through a holiday season, Christmas season. And the spending figures for last Christmas I want to give to you. The average amount that a person spent on Christmas gifts last year was $983. Last year, on the, the, this whole conglomerate of Black Friday or whatever you want to call it, they spent a record $5 billion. Then on Cyber Monday, Americans spent an additional $6.59 billion. Compare that to missions. Studies have shown on average Christians give less than a penny a day to missions. That's $3.65 a year. Again, I think it's wonderful that we give gifts at Christmas time. And I like getting a gift just like the next guy. But you know, here's what I'd like us to consider. Next Christmas, will we give our most expensive gifts to missions, to the Lord Jesus Christ through missions. I know some of you have wives, you have children, and that's okay to be doing that. I mean, that's what Christmas is uh, partly about, is giving gifts because they gave gifts to Jesus. But where is our focus? Is it on getting stuff or is it giving? So let's 
give financially to missions. And then D, I want to share this this morning. It's time to go. Again, we have people answering the call to go and be missionaries. Unfortunately, there's not, not a lot of us. You know, most of missionaries that were called to the mission field were sitting in a worship service. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of their hearts. And they decided to go and do something about it because God convicted them that they should go. He called them to go. And we need to be praying for more people to go. And again, to, in today's world, if you go to China, you go to India, uh, most times you will need a technical skill. And so you have people that are in industry or whatever today, and they're in businesses today, they can use those technical skills to go and share the gospel with others. And so again, our part is to pray, to love everyone who is lost, and then to give to, uh, to missions so that others can hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love what God says as we go and as we are faithful to do what God has called us to do. Jesus said, and surely I am with you even to the end of the age. So if the good news is that we can share the gospel, the G-O-S-P-L, that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again, that he lives today, and that they can trust him as Savior, then we need to go. But we have the task of reaching people for Jesus Christ. Jesus was ascending to heaven, and before he went to heaven, he said to them that I will go, but I'm going to send a comfort of the Holy Spirit of Jesus who lives inside all Christians. When Jesus was walking with his disciples, he said, I have been with you, but the Holy Spirit will be in you. So how did these 11 men handle this commission? There were 120 Christians gathered on the day of Pentecost. But after P Peter preached the gospel, 3,000 additional believers were added to the church. Later in Acts, we see that another 5,000 men were added to those who were saved. But in Acts chapter 8, there was great persecution against the church and they were scattered. Paul and others took the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, but all of them died martyrs' death. As Peter was being crucified upside down, he, he says, I, I wonder if he thought this as he was being crucified. We made a good try, but this is the end. But it wasn't the end. It wasn't the end. It was the beginning because God has called each and every one of us. As new generations are born, God calls us until he returns to go and share the gospel with others. According to Fuller Theological Seminary, 70% of the evangelization of the world has occurred in the last century. Last century and a half. At the beginning of the 20, 20th century, about 2% of the world's people were practicing Christians. By 2010, that number increased to 12%. Christianity in some parts of the world is the fastest growing, I don't like to call it a religion because it's a relationship, but it's the fastest growing in the world. Every day, 178,000 people are coming to Christ. Now, we might not see that here in the United States, but where they're being persecuted, people are coming to Christ. And I think of the ministry of CEF. CEF is a ministry that has, was established in the first part of the 20th century. It was started in 1937 by a man named Jesse Irvin Overholzer. Jesse Irvin Overholzer's parents were from Lancaster County. They moved west during the Civil War, and they landed in California eventually through a wagon train. It was there in California that Jesse Irvin Overholzer came to Christ. Because at the age of six, he was sitting down and he was looking at the family Bible and he was convicted of his own sin in his heart and he went to his mother one day and said, Mom, how do I get rid of my burden of sin? And his mom looked at him and said, Go ask your father. So he went to his father and his father said, Jesse, you're too young to understand. Wait until you're older. So Jesse waited until he was older. He was nine. 
he still couldn't get the answer that he needed. By age 12, he became quite disillusioned and he thought to himself, if I become a member of the church, maybe that'll take care of my sin problem. His pastor looked at him and as he asked the pastor if he could become a member of the church, his pastor said, no boy of 12 years of age will join my church. And so Jesse thought, you know what, if I can't get rid of my sin, I might as well enjoy it. And uh, Jesse was a natural born leader and uh, he started a gang and they brought a lot of havoc and heartache to the neighborhood in which he lived. In fact, one night he and his friends went out to a farmer's barn. They took the cow out of the barn, built a ramp to the roof, took the ramp away and left. Now, by today's standards, you'd say, well, that's just a prank. But back then that was serious stuff. And you know what, when the farmer came out and he heard his cow uh, bawling on the barn roof, couldn't get off, uh, I'm sure he was very put out. But again, he did all kinds of things like that and it wasn't until he was 19 years of age. Again, started when he was six. At 19, a friend invited him to go to a crusade, a tent crusade. And it was there for the first time that Jesse heard the gospel message and he came to Christ. He heard what he was looking for. And through the years, many things happened in his life, which I can't get into this morning. But one of the things that Jesse noticed as he was a pastor of a local church, and as he was realizing that God's grace was incredible in his life, that he realized that children weren't being reached in a mass way. Uh, children weren't being reached at all. And so, he prayed about it and God led him to start the Ministry of Child Evangelism Fellowship in 1937. Actually, we share our anniversary with two things, Batman and Spam. So those two things were started in 1937 too. But Jesse started this ministry and he started in California. One of the first areas that Jesse came to was the city of Chicago. And one day as he was walking the streets of Chicago and he was talking to the Lord, he said, you know what? If we can reach children in this city, we can reach children anywhere. And so there was a woman named Mrs. Philip D. Armour. She was the wife of the famous meat packing giant at that time, Armour Meats. She started good news clubs all over Chicago. Many children were hearing the good news of the gospel. He came to Philadelphia second, and he lit a fire. And again, he was not a great orator. He was a quiet speaker. He cried a lot while he spoke. But you know, he lit a fire under those people, and the ministry started here in Pennsylvania in 1938. And that ministry has continued on uh, throughout the years. And if you would go to the next slide. Again, our purpose, Child Evangelism Fellowship, as he founded the ministry in 1937, our purpose is to evangelize children. That's what we do. We share the gospel through Good News Clubs, which are an hour club that meets after school, either in a school building or in a neighborhood or in a church, or it could be a release time class. In Pennsylvania, we have a very friendly release time law which allows us to go into the school, take the children for one hour, not to exceed 36 hours in a year, and take them to a neutral facility off school grounds and then take them back again to, to that facility. So we evangelize. We disciple them in the Word of God. So those good news clubs, we disciple the children in the Word of God. And then our third leg of our purpose statement is to get those children into solid, good, solid, Bible-believing churches for Christian living. And that's where we partner with the local church. We partner with the Good News Club because, you know, we could start Good News Clubs, but we need the local church to do it. We need you to do it because we can't do it by ourselves. If we have the support of the local church, that will enable us to go in into the schools and into the neighborhoods to reach them. Again, that is our goal. We are an arm of the church to help the church reach into the community. Because we have so many churches, and I'm not saying that's Big Valley Bible Church, because you're not, because you go get the kids. But we have a lot of churches that do not reach their kids in their neighborhood. 
I was talking to a pastor. He lived about three blocks from an elementary school. And I said, you know what? You don't even have to work with CEF. Would you go reach that school? And they said, well, we're busy. We got our programs. We're doing this. We're doing that. And I said, you're too busy to go reach that school for Jesus Christ? You've got to be kidding me. And I've continued to pray for uh, that, pa that pastor and pray that God will get a hold of his heart because what a mission field over there. They could have those kids there for a release time class or they could go into the school, but they refuse to do it. And so we need to be working together to reach these children, to channel these children into solid Bible-believing churches because one of our things that we like to do is we like to give those names to the church. And I know you've gotten some names from release time classes that uh, we have done. And of course, uh, it's kind of fed your, your Wednesday evening program, which is exciting uh, that uh, you know, we're able to go pick up those kids, bring them, and uh, again, share the word of God with them. Because some of these children, I tell you, it's, you know, I hear stories from, from Linda all the time about some of these kids and the home lives that they live. And you, you've seen it too. And I pray for them and my heart aches for them. But we need to be reaching them, continuing to reach them with the gospel. Again, Child Evangelism Fellowship is, uh, and we can change to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to, you to see where we are uh, having some of our release time classes and some of our good news clubs. But you can see there, and I can't read it, but we have Carroll Elementary, which is in uh, Perry County. And uh, we have Juniata Elementary. Um, we have uh, Lewistown Intermediate, Lewistown Elementary. And you can see the different schools, Strode's Mills Elementary and uh, Indian Valley Elementary. We have clubs in those schools, and those schools were reaching children with the good news of the gospel. Uh, we also not only do uh, good news clubs, but we also do party clubs. A lot of people will say to me, well, Mark, I can't serve week after week at a good news club, but I could teach a one-time club, or I could host a one-time club. And during the holidays, which Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, 4th of July, we encourage people to have or host a party club at their home or at a rec center, wherever we can gather the children together. And we share with them at Christmas time the true meaning of Christmas. In fact, this past Christmas we did a, a party club at uh, Rec Park and we had 36 children show up, which was exciting. And we had 30 parents that didn't leave and they stayed. And so we had the opportunity to share the gospel with them too. So we had 60 some odd people uh, at the Rec Center uh, at Rec Park uh, being able to share the good news of the gospel with them. And that's, that's what the ministry is all about. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're praying for you as you reach uh, Reedsville and surrounding areas. But we're asking you this morning if you would continue to come aboard and help us to reach these children. Again, we need workers, uh, as Pastor Jeff shared this morning. We need workers. We need prayer warriors. We need people who give to the ministry of CF because our policy is this, ask God and tell his people. That's what we do. We don't get government funding, but we ask God and we tell his people and the need. And of course it takes funds to do that. And so we ask that uh, you would continue just to pray about supporting the ministry of Child Evangelism Fellowship. You know, we're living in hard times, difficult times. Exciting times, because we see the world around us and it seems to be falling apart, but God is still on his throne. He's still in control. And you know what? He's going to do his thing. But he wants to use you. He wants to use me to do that. And so pray about what God would have you to do. We do have a display back there. And we have some different things back there on the display. We have an impact magazine, which comes out from international headquarters. And it just shares what God is doing all over the world through the ministry of Child Evangelism Fellowship. And then I also have back there a sign-up sheet. We have a mailing list that we'll share for Mifflin, Juniata, and Perry County. It's our local area here. Uh, we have a mailing list where you can sign up and get our newsletter and you can keep updated and you can be praying because we also have a prayer calendar that you can be praying for the ministry of CEF. 
We're also praying that God would raise up. We have a, a ministry coordinator, but we're praying for a local director. And we're praying that God would raise up a local director for our local area. Um, I have 19 chapters that I'm responsible for. And uh, we're down to one chapter that needs a director, and that's Mifflin, Juniata, and Perry, for whatever reason. So if you know of somebody that has a burden for children and is organized and uh, loves people and uh, loves children and would like to be uh, uh, a local director, uh, please let us know. We'd gl be glad to, to talk to that individual. So again, we have a sign-up sheet back there for the newsletter. We also have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to get involved in the ministry, whether it's helping with one of these release time classes or having a party club. Uh, one other ministry that we have before I end this morning is our five-day club ministry. Again, that's where I was saved through the summer ministry. And we use young people. We train them uh, in Western Pennsylvania, and then they go out throughout the state of Pennsylvania, and they do five-day clubs all over the state of Pennsylvania. And we're praying that God would raise up a good group of young people this summer to go and reach children through the five-day club ministry, which is just a, a club that meets for five days. And uh, basically, we do all the teaching. We just need host homes and places where we can hold it and we can gather children together uh, to have these five-day clubs. So I know that as we go and as we're faithful to do what God wants us to do, and I, I love the ministry of CEF because our statement of faith has never changed and our purpose has never changed either. We do not give clothing. We do not feed the hungry. We have one sole purpose, and that is to reach children with the gospel. And so please be praying for us. Uh, please visit our table back there. We'd be glad to talk to you if you'd like to be involved in the ministry of CEF. And uh, we'll just pray that God would do great things. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you once again for our time this morning. Father, I just pray that uh, Big Valley Bible Church would continue to be faithful, and I know they are faithful, to share the word, to share the truth, and to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be all that you want us to be. And Father, we're going to thank you for what you're going to do because we are living in exciting days, but help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.